right, let's go. The episode we have for you today is out of this world, literally, because today we have a real life NASA astronaut, Commander Sunita Williams, the second woman of Indian origin to be selected by NASA for a space mission. She has spent a total of 322 days in space on two missions to the International Space Station. And until recently, she held a record for the most spacewalk time for a woman, 50 hours and 40 minutes. She's completed seven spacewalks, and if that wasn't enough, she ran the Boston Marathon, but wait for it, in space. And her adventures as Commander Sunita Williams is far from over. She's currently training for her third long duration mission aboard the International Space Station. On Earth, astronaut Sunita Williams has over 3,000 flight hours in over 30 different aircrafts. Basically, she's a legend. I'm dying of excitement, so let's just get to it. So hello, Commander Sunita Williams, or should I say Kamcho Commander, because we are both Gucci girls, and I never, ever thought I would get a chance to say Kamcho to a real-life astronaut. You make um, us so proud. Thank you, Majama. <laughs> nice to see you. Nice to hear from you. Uh, nice to be with everybody today. It's, it's quite an honor, and uh, it's very humbling to to hear my, uh, you, you talk about me in this way, but I'm, I'm love to share uh, my experience. And I know that it's just a, a stepping stone for many other people uh, in the future to do much bigger and better things. So happy to be here. Oh, well, you have some pretty out of these world accolades, but one that I found super cool was your elementary school in your hometown of Needham, Massachusetts was rebuilt and renamed in your honor. And now it's called the Sunita L. Williams Elementary School. So what were you like when you were growing up in that school? Wow. Uh, yeah, my husband reminds me I have to be good or they might chip that name right off that school. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, I was so lucky uh, to have wonderful parents. My father, of course, is uh, originally from India and moved to the United States. And my, my mother's from, uh, you know, a, a pretty blue collar family in Ohio. And they took a big chance. They moved to Boston because my dad... Uh, was a was a budding successful doctor and got some offers in Boston. You know, neither one of them had been from that area and, and moved there. And so I was very lucky to go to the public schools right outside of Boston. Of course, it's, you know, a hotbed for universities, um, in, you know, in this country, practically, you know, in the United States. And uh, there's a there's an amazing uh, resources there. And uh, I I had a wonderful time. I reflect back in particular during the dedication ceremony about my time in that town and my time in those schools. And of course I had to be a good student. My brother and my sister who are older than me um, were really good students and they had some of the same teachers of course. And so, you know, you have to do that family legend thing and, and stick with, with the, you know, your older siblings. Um, so I was a good student there. And I, like I mentioned, I was very lucky to have the parents that I had that really opened my eyes in time when um, you know diversity wasn't such a big, big word, and and allowed me to you know be part of that, be really in in and be part of that. Of course, my parents were diverse, uh, and at the time it was uh, you know we were one of the the only Indian family in the town, you know, <laughs> so people knew us as the Pandyas, of course, the funny name. Um, you know, we were we were swimmers also, so we we're student athletes when we were even when we were really young. Uh, my dad had an experience um, in India where he uh, almost drowned. And so he made a point to make sure that all of us kids knew how to swim when we were very young. And we took, we all took it up as, as competitive swimmers. So I think the things that I remember when I was that young and people in, from my uh, hometown that remember us coming to school with wet hair and, and, uh, and doing pretty good at school, but also, of course, having a lot of fun and, um, you know, being sure of yourself. Uh, as as much as you can as like a as a elementary school kid. <laughs> Do you ever go to space camp? I always wanted to go, but I never got to go. Did you ever go? I never went. You know, it was really space was not on my mind as a kid, except for the classic things. Of course, when we walked on the moon, um, you know, I was very young at the time, but I remember, you know, the black and white TV and and then the spinoffs from there. I think were more per. per uh, pertinent in my lifetime, like the, you know, the funny shows like Lost in Space, for example, and things like that from when I was a kid. And so I really never connected with space, like thinking like, oh, I could be part of it. It never really dawned on me. It wasn't what I was familiar with. 
You know, I wanted to be Olympic swimmer. I wanted to be a veterinarian because I loved animals and my dad was a doctor. You know, those are things that like, I felt like I could put my, I could have grasp to. Um, but of course, neither one of those worked out. And I, <laughs> and I ended up doing other things. And uh, really the path for me getting to, um, to NASA was through the military. And that was sort of a, a little bit of a happenstance, but it was a, it was a, it was a good route for me because I like that teamwork that the military brings out in people. How did you go from the military into becoming an astronaut? Yeah, and it's not the only path. Let, uh, let me just make sure your, your listeners and your readers know about that too. You know, we have people here, of course, who are in the military, all the different fields. I was a helicopter pilot. We have jet pilots, we have submariners, we have SEALs, um, we have military medical doctors, we have not military medical doctors, medical doctors, we have a veterinarian even, we have doctors and veterinarians and scientists and engineers and teachers in the field. Um, but one path was the path that I took from the military was uh, go and become an expert in your field, which was for me flying helicopters, and then I uh, went to test pilot school. So that's sort of the traditional old way uh, that people had become astronauts way in the beginning of the program because all these spacecraft are new and we need to test them out. And um, that of course was the beginning. And actually that is what's going on right now. You know, I'm in the middle of testing a new spacecraft and, and the future for us, the Artemis program is a brand new spacecraft. So of course, test pilots are still desired, um, but also we want people with all these different backgrounds. So I went, I went into the military, was a helicopter pilot, test pilot, and then I started finding out what you have to do. And one of the really cool things about a community that you're in like that, if people had been selected before, or if you have some familiarity, space camp, for example, or coming to Johnson Space Center, or Kennedy Space Center, or any of the space centers, is seeing what they do. And then all of a sudden, it doesn't be, seem so far away. It almost seems like wow, what they're doing is similar to what I'm doing now. I just have to get some other skills to maybe make myself fit into that place. And so I knew I had to get my master's degree. I knew I needed to know a little bit more about orbital mechanics and flying in space. And those are things I, I took up on my own and then um, did my application. And along with that are some people that you meet along the way. Of course, mentors and friends who are in that business. And I had some really wonderful mentors and friends who said, Sunny, you need to apply. You'll like this. This is right up your alley. And it's really nice to have people in your, who are cheering for you. So that's, uh, that's pretty cool. And that sort personal of put me over the edge. <laughs> personal pump up crew. I feel like yes. that's super important. Yes. Did you ever have, a lot of people talk about imposter syndrome, like it's hard for people to try new things or they feel like an imposter sometimes. Did you ever have that, am I good enough syndrome? Oh gosh, yes. I think everybody does. I mean, it would, I think you're not being honest with yourself to, to probably not be that way. I think, you know, there's a lot of people who have a lot of confidence and as, the, as folks get older and experience, of course you, you deserve that. But as you're, as you're going through those stages and you're, and you're pushing yourself, if you push yourself actually to do something new, you know, how do you, how, how would anybody know how to do everything right the first time? So absolutely. And you know, there's, there are times when you can sit and ask all the questions, but Sometimes you don't have time to really ask those questions and get those answers, and you just have to press through and give it your best shot. And I think that's a that's a softer version of imposter syndrome, where you're just like, okay, I'm just going to go with it. And when and then I think the maturity part comes in when you when you weigh the pros and cons. Like if I just go with it, it's going to everything's going to be okay. But if I just go with it, and then that something bad might happen, this is when I need to raise my hand and really show my cards and say. Hey, you know what? I don't, I don't get it. And one of the really good things about having a structure and a team, like I found with the military, is that it opens you up to to be able to do that. And, and you can start figuring out the priorities and the pros and cons of when you should and when you shouldn't ask ask questions. But I think all of us go through it. Like I, you know, here you have this big task, and somebody, you know, your boss tells you to do this, and you don't know how to do it. And um, you, what you do is you do research. And you do the best you can, and you ask people along the way, and 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 learn, you know. And um, if you don't take those steps where you might fail, then you're not going to get any farther, right? So my, I think in my lifetime, I've had successes, but I've had failures too, <laughs> and those have made me a a better, more rounded person. Yeah, 
Failure, I bet. I think that's an important topic to kind of delve into a little bit. Like, you know, when you're training as an astronaut and how, what kind of psychological mindset do they teach you about failure? Because you could have all the data in the world. You're out doing something on a spacewalk. By the way, ever since I've seen Gravity with Sandra Bullock, I am so frightened. Like, I literally have nightmares <laughs> that I will be untethered. I, my husband claims that in preparation for this interview in my sleep, I was like, don't untether me. <laughs> so, don't worry. We, we have those nightmares too, but they, uh, they, they put them to bed by making us do this with virtual reality. And you really, you know, you come to that conclusion, like I am never going to be untethered. I am going to double check and check and check and check before I actually take my hands off of a structure. So yeah, yeah, they scare the heck out of us too. So you're not alone. <laughs> But, you know, um, you know, insofar as, you know, space and uh, success and failure, you know, I have not had a spacewalk, for example, that something has gone, that everything has gone according to plan. We always have something that's a little bit different. I mean, it's the environment that you work in. You can't emulate, simulate everything that we're going to do in space here on Earth. So, of course, there's going to be, potentially, there, there will be some surprises. And that is just the nature of the beast. Um, we as astronauts go through a lot of uh, training to sort of simulate uh, what it could be like. Um, uh, for example, we go on National Outdoor Leadership School courses where you learn a little bit about leadership, followership, teamwork, and also it's an environment that's going to be a little bit uncomfortable. Uh, for example, in the snow, uh, in the desert, uh, in this on the seashore. You know, those are those are places that um, if, if you're in a survival situation, can be a little tricky. So we do that for a little while just so we can build those techniques. It's not the exact same thing that we're going to experience when we're in space, but it's the same feeling like, oh, where did I put that? I lost that thing. That's the only one of those things I had. Like now, how are we going to manage? We're going to have to MacGyver it and try to figure out how we're going to work through this problem, you know? And those are just, like I said, psychological techniques to get you through those parts that are going to be hard that you can't really predict beforehand. So would you, so are you saying that basically practicing other sort of adventure survival things, basically trying something new because inevitably you will fail trying something new and just using that as a parallel to practice that muscle? Yeah, absolutely. That's, that you're absolutely right. You know, and then you sort of, you know that you can handle things that are a little bit more, maybe out of your control or maybe you made that mistake. So those are, you know, those are things that, uh, that are uncomfortable to a lot of people who are you know, control freaks, they, they want to be in control of everything and never make a mistake. But um, it, we know that we're, we're all human and we're, that's going to happen. And we know that, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, the, just the planets aren't going to align and, and you know, what, whatever. Some, it's your, you know, we've been up on the space station living there for almost 20 years. So inevitably something's going to break, you know, whether it's the toilet, the exercise equipment, a science experiment, a piece of equipment outside. And you just have to be ready for that and just go, okay, you know, it was, it was time and it was my time. So now I got to, now I got to press, I got to react. And I, you know, I can't just sit here and not do anything. I, I need to have a, a, a way to go through this, move through this. Um, you know, I wonder if this has a lot to do with maybe your faith and some of the things that maybe your family taught you because your dad, like you said, came on a spaceship of his own here on a boat with a one-way ticket from Gujarat all the way to the U.S. Um, I, 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 when I was envisioning that, I kept imagining what he must have felt like when he saw land because for us, a lot of our a little bit later. And I wonder that parallel for you, like how you felt when you saw Earth from outer space for the first time. And I, and I also read that your dad gave you the Bhagavad Gita and also the Up Upanishads to bring with you. So can you can you get into that? Because we're all wondering. My mom was like, you better ask her. <laughs> what did she think? Did she find God? Tell, ask her. So mom, I'm asking her. <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting. I'm going to address real quick the, 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 the vision that you put back in my mind of my dad coming here on the boat, you know, People say sometimes like, oh, you know, you're, you're so brave. And I'm like, well, I just sort of follow what a sort of a career path is like. And, um, you know, looked at what, like, what's the next step? How can I make myself better? How can I do this? How can I have all the qualifications? How do I, you know, get to be able to go into space and do spacewalk? And I look at that as fairly simple compared to when people take those, those big steps like my dad did and get on a boat and really not know what was at the, at the end. Like maybe heard about it, read about it 
maybe he made a phone call to someone in the United States and sort of thought he knew what it was going to be like, but really, really took that big step. And I, I think that's pretty brave. And particularly when your family, your culture, you're leaving behind and not knowing whether or not you're going to go back or what, you know, sort of like, I think about the, the people who are going to go to Mars for the first time, you know, like, <laughs> how is that all going to be? And so I feel like what he did and what people do on this earth um, to make those next steps in their lives, whatever they may be, it's, it's the equally as brave and it's amazing. Um, now, getting to, this, getting to space and, and what my dad has instilled in me and my, both my parents, my mother is Catholic, my father is Hindu, and we you know, had the, the pleasure of being able to go to church with my dad reading the Bhagavad Gita. I was the youngest to me you know, while I was sitting there and everybody else was doing some of the, the Catholic stuff until I was old enough to understand that. Um, he shared so much about the Hindu religion and spirituality with us. It was really awesome. So have, have a broader sense of people around the world and what other people uh, feel and see and sense and believe in and appreciate that. Um, and it all sort of came to a culmination, of course, when you're in space and you're like, what is your purpose here? Why are we here? Why do we, you know, we're looking back at our planet and, and going, wow, you know, how is this possible? How is it possible that I have family and friends down there? How is it possible that, you know, I get up in the morning and go for a run and take my dog for a walk and be rained on and, you know, the wind is blowing in my hair. It's, it's just a, a miracle that we have this planet in this humongous solar system where we all live and breathe. And I wish we all got along real well <laughs> because I think we should all appreciate, um, you know, our small time on this little spaceship we call Earth. It's a, uh, it's pretty, pretty amazing. And, you know, you have to, you have to step back and go like the, the folks who are unhappy, well, that's, they're, they're really missing the big picture here. And they're, and they're missing the wonder and the miracle of, of life in our, on our planet. And so I think, I think that really um, was profound when I was up in space. It was obvious and it was easy to see. And so I, I also think about people who are, you know, scientists and explorers who had vision like Einstein without even having to go off our planet to take those steps and have those amazing self-awareness steps about what our, where our place is in the universe. That's a miracle. So I was lucky I got to actually see it with my own two eyes, but there's really amazing people on this earth. Um, and we all need to take our planet, uh, not take our planet for granted. I couldn't agree more. Um, is there like a spot on the space station, like the spot, like a viewing deck or something? Oh yeah, it's called the cupola, and so okay. it's a and it's interesting place where it's at. It's a, on the end of what we call a node. Nodes are where other modules connect, and in this node, there's other equipment, and one of them is the weightlifting equipment. And so we all have to do resi resistive exercise as well as cardiovascular exercise. So you're in between sets of resistive exercise, and you you just float up and you look out this window, and it's a big circle, and then there's six windows uh, at an angle on the side, and you can see the universe from there. It's incredible. You can see our planet, and you can see the universe. You see the, the curvature of the Earth, and then all the stars beyond, and it's just spectacular. You, you know, if, you're, if you can't find somebody, you're going to find them in the cupola. <laughs> just, yeah. uh, you know, not necessarily daydreaming, because you don't need to daydream. All you need to do is look out the window, and you just are like, wow. I mean, this is incredible, incredible place. Do you, recall, you know. your, do you recall the first time? Did you have that moment we all envision we might, that feeling when you saw Earth from the outside, I guess? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And actually, it was before I was at the space station. I was on my shuttle flight up to the space station. And I, I flew up to the flight deck and looked out the, the windows on the space shuttle. And, and there it was. I mean, you know, bigger than life, practically. <laughs> And you're like, oh my God, it's round. They're right. Those people in elementary school are right. And you know, it's it's beautiful. I mean, it's every color that you can imagine. You know, from the atmosphere to you know the colors of the ocean, the greens and the blues and the mountains, and the purples and the whites and yeah, you know, yellows. It's it's all there, I and mean, it's uh, it's amazing. Just simply amazing. You know, I've seen a lot of pictures, and it seems like camera technology has gotten much better. But do you feel like us mere mortals? Is it do we? Is it still different in space? It, it is. It is, and I think it's the. Uh, you know, we've taken some time lapse photography to sort of get the idea of, of flying around and seeing how things change. I think that is really a significant. And when you see bigger picture things like 
you know, when, when you're sitting here and you have a thunderstorm above your head, you're like, oh, that sucks. I have to sort of be stay inside. <laughs> but you know what? It's a, it's, a, it's a balancing act around the planet. Our planet is alive. And from that perspective, you see lightning in one area and then lightning in another, you know, that's the charge balance. And it could be across a continent. It's big. It's like a lot bigger than the way we microly look at our existence on this planet. And it's it makes you realize that, you know, um, it's alive. Everything's alive. The water, the rocks, it's all moving. It's it, our planet is not a, it's not sitting still. And the, the weather on top of that, um, the atmosphere really enhances that makes that motion a little bit quicker, but you can see it over time. I've spent six months on in space and you can see different parts of the planet totally changing. Of course, that sounds so obvious with seasons, but it really happens. And you know, just formations in the ocean of uh, like like ice swirls or clouds where uh, that are swirling around mountain tops and not mountain tops sticking out, and it really brings that picture back home to you that it's not a stagnant rock that we live on. It's very much a motion, a, a live motion planet. You know, I really enjoyed. So, for my audience, if you get a chance. Google on YouTube videos of Sunita, Commander Sunita. Um, she gives the cutest, most detailed tours, MTV crib style of the International <laughs> Space Station. Um, so you can bring some of what she's saying to life visually. But I heard that you brought chai and samosas to outer space, which by the way, you are the queen of my heart. But ever <laughs> since I read that, I am dying to know, did you have chutney with it? Because... Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, unfortunately, not specific chutney, you know, you sort of have to do make do right again, like I mentioned how you just have to do with what you have, right. So, you know, that's, uh, we, we need to figure out a, a way to bring chutney up in a, a squeezable bottle or something like that, you know, we usually have it homemade or in a glass container, uh, because of the ingredients in it. So we have to figure it out. But like, we did have wasabi. And we did have like garlic paste and horseradish and of course ketchup and mustard and all that kind of stuff. So there were other condiments up there, but a real chutney would be really nice. So a little bit plain, but you know, you have to also imagine and just bring back those days of being on earth with your family, having a nice samosa with good chutney and just remember that <laughs> and think of that while you're, or you're biting into it. And it's, it's all, it's great. It's, you know, when you're up in space, you don't have this, you don't have the ability to go and go, oh, I wish I should have gone to that restaurant. You have what you have and you really enjoy it. And I think part of, you know, just like you mentioned, food brings back a lot of memories of family and friends and get togethers and celebrations. And I think that's, even though it might be not be the best, it's the best that you have up there. And it reminds you of, of wonderful people and places back home. You know, staying on the topic of food, which by the way, I could talk about food for hours. If I'm not yeah. eating, I'm thinking about it. I hear that you love to cook as well and that you are watching cooking videos in space. So here is my biggest question. <laughs> like I barely get good internet here on earth. How are you watching cooking channel in space? And if you are, who are you watching? Oh, that's funny that you asked the question. So <laughs> yeah, you know, people ask and they're like, are you crazy? Cause you can't cook like that. But it, but it is fun and you actually do have some time to actually learn some other techniques while you're up there. So why not? So uh, honestly, we don't have great internet. Um, we have an okay internet. If you can imagine when you're flying so fast around the planet, it, it does, the signal doesn't really work so good. So we have to have it through our mission control, which I'm sitting in right now. Um, it, they have to sort of relay that signal back to you. So it, it, it is actually slow. So the way we get around that is by saying, telling our, some of our, we have psychological support folks who help us out and, you know, prepare us to get ready to go to space. And so I would talk to those guys and say, hey, I like cooking channels. So um, I like, um, you know, Italian cooking. We had Giada up there. We had Emerald up there. We had Alton Brown up there, for example. You know, just as, uh, you know, pre-recorded shows that, uh, like while we were making dinner, we could turn one on and watch what somebody else might be thinking about when they're making dinner. <laughs> So, or how to make dinner. So yeah, we had, we had a stockpile of shows that we had when we were up there, which was, which was great. And it just, it just brings you back home a little bit and gives you some ideas about when you, when you want to go home about what you want to make.
So how, like, I'm really dying to know. So how does a chai and samosa get up there? Do you have to pack it separately, like in that special space way? Because when we were younger in the 80s, we got to try like space ice cream. And I have to admit, I remember thinking this is cool, but it didn't taste very good. <laughs> I know, I know. Well, technology has changed and it's gotten better. So not everything has to be dehydrated. Some of the stuff is is prepackaged, and then you know, just like when you go to the, for example, the Indian store, and you can buy uh, prepackaged um, sag paneer, for example, and you go right. home and you just heat it in water or microwave it. So it's similar type of stuff, stuff that's ready made. It has to have some preservatives, so it's not mama's home cooked meal, but it's pretty good. Um, and it just, like I said, more brings back some of those memories. So, uh, so, but samosas are a little bit different because they're one of the things we don't have a lot of is bread, and that outer coating is flaky, obviously, right? So we ha you have to be very careful about that one. Because <laughs> when you eat anything that's flaky, it flies all over the place. It gets in your hair, it gets in other people's hair, it gets in your sleeping bag. So we did get a couple, that's not like on the main menu all the time because it's too problematic. But you can ask for some special things that you really love. And so I asked for samosas. I got a package of samosas and they were they were gone after one sitting, unfortunately, because everybody, well, fortunately, everybody loved them. So we. We ate them while we we're, you know, we have on the weekends, we sometimes have a specialty dinner and we break out the stuff that we get from home and our family gets to select like a, a mailbox type size of stuff that they might want to send. And so my family knew that I like samosas and chai, so they sent that up. And chai, you know, is, is can be just freeze dried instant that you just add hot water to and then shake it and you drink it out of a bag. But it's the best combination, you know. Yeah. <laughs> But with all that eating in outer space, is that why you were working out so hard? Like, how does that work? <laughs> yeah, well, you you do. We, some people have gotten a little chubby while they're up there. <laughs> but, you can actually gain weight in space, too. Oh, yeah, people yeah. all have this problem in outer space or here on Earth. <laughs> I know, I know. Well, you know, in the past, folks have been like, oh, you know, just be careful, you know, because you're going to lose bone density, muscle mass. That's why we have the, the treadmill, the bicycle and the weightlifting equipment. So you do have to, you do have to work out. Um, you want to maintain your bone density. You want to maintain muscle mass. So when you come back to earth, you'll be a functioning person without any long lasting problems. Um, so we do do, we do work out about two hours a day or so. Uh, some half of it cardiovascular, half of it uh, resistive exercise for the bone density. And it, it's, it's wonderful also. Psychologically, it's really nice to just get on the treadmill, maybe have a movie. When I ran the marathon, I had um, uh, snippets of the, you know, highlights of marathons of the past, so I could see outside other people doing the same thing. When you're weightlifting, it's really nice to have music playing in the background or go up to the cupola window to take a look between sets and stuff like that too. So it's enjoyable, um, but it's a, it is a necessary evil. It's not like one of the things on earth where you wake up and you go, ah, I don't want to do that today. You really have to. So you have to get yourself, bring yourself psychologically to that piece of exercise equipment, get on and do something because every moment that you're up there, your body is sensing that it doesn't have gravity. So it doesn't have to maintain that bone density and muscle mass. It's like, oh, I can, I can shed that. I, it can go away. And the only way to maintain a, a standard level of it is to work out every, every day. We're going to have some challenges when we take those bigger trips and we go, you know, um, onto Mars and we're gonna to have to figure out exercise equipment that's gonna be able to accommodate that. So when people get to Mars, they'll be able to, to function and then they'll have to take the trip back home. So that we'll have to work on that too. So it's, these are difficult problems and we're gonna work these out. We're gonna suss these all out uh, when we go back to the moon and figure it out so the next generation of explorers can actually take that trip to Mars. So it's, it's, a, it's a work in progress. <laughs> So when you're on the treadmill, though, how do you stay on it? Because wouldn't you just float up? Oh, yeah, yeah. But um, so uh, the treadmill is sort of like what we have here on Earth, but you want to hold yourself down, right? So you have a harness that goes over your shoulders ah. and then around your waist, sort of like a backpack for hiking. And then on the sides of the waist strap, you have essentially like a bungee or, or a, a, you can sometimes set the weight, actually, with the equipment we have. And so then you can moderate your weight that way and that will hold you down. So every time you jump up, it pulls you right back down. It makes you run maybe a little bit funny and it pulls down on your hips as well as your shoulders, but that's what it's supposed to do because those are the areas specifically your hips 
that you will lose bone density. And so you want that stress and you want that pounding of your feet on the ground to, to be able to simulate walking here on earth. So all that working out, I have to ask, do people sweat in space? Oh yeah, yeah, it's a little gross. <laughs> You know, it's funny because, you know, um, I grew up outside of Boston and, you know, you sure you sweat, but then the wind blows and it sort of starts to dry up and you, you don't feel as gross. You know, you're sort of sweaty and disgusting, but it, it dries up on in space. It doesn't dry up. It sort of just gloms on you. And there's not that uh, convective cooling of the wind going across you, taking that water away. And when I was running the marathon, I actually had a change of clothes that I thought I was going to need because I had practiced up to about 15 miles and I knew that I would be soaking wet, but I just pressed through it. I said, oh, forget it. I don't care. And had extra towels there and just sort of soaked it all up. But to the point that my hands were all, uh, my fingers were all wrinkly, you know, because you were so in the, you know, feeling wet for a long period of time. And, uh, and we keep the space station around 75 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's cool, but it's not like there's a breeze going. It just sort of right when you're where you're working out it sort of gloms on you it's gross. <laughs> gross um okay so let's talk about the spacewalk a little bit um i mean that's a lot of hours you spent in space outside just like walking um what are the highlights tell us something about what that was like yeah yeah you know um, we we practice here quite a bit in a big pool so we have a good idea of what we're going to do um you know so it's not like we're going out without a plan. We have a pretty big plan. And we know that we, we plan it sort of to the, at least like the 15 minute time frame. So we have a lot of things, tasks that we need to do in that time. So I think one of the biggest things that weighs on your head during spacewalk is like, I want to get everything done and I don't want to make a mistake. <laughs> um, I've had those experiences where I didn't get everything done and I did make a mistake. <laughs> so, you know, I think I'm, I'm over that, that fear, but those are the things that are really going on in your, in your background. But again, we talk about prioritization. So prioritizing what are the things that have to get done and then what mistakes are okay and what mistakes are not okay. What's not okay is letting go and floating away. What's not okay is your, your partner out there having a problem and you not being able to know where they are and get them back. It's the two of you are a little bit of a, a life connection there. Um, so I remember when I went out, all that to say, when I went out on my first spacewalk, it was dark out nighttime. It's 45 minutes of nighttime and then 45 minutes of daylight as we're going around the planet. And so 16 sunrises and sunsets. So on a typical six hour spacewalk, this is happening a couple of hey, times. Hold on, let's pause a second. I, I just want to make sure I understood this right. So when you're out there, you're seeing 16 sunrises and 16 sunsets on like one walk? Ooh. No, no. So it's only six hours. And so right. that would be three, three sunrises and three sunsets, essentially. Wow, three, that's three, insane. Yeah. yeah. And so, you know, you, you can, you, you don't have a watch, but you can sort of time how long you're out there by, by the, how many times around the planet you go. <laughs> wow. But incredible. it, it was nighttime. So, um, I just had my helmet lights on. I went, get out, went to work and I start doing this task that I'm doing because that's the biggest thing on, on my mind. And then the sun starts to come up and then you could really see the planet below you. And I was like, oh my God. <laughs> and it, you know, puts you back in the place of like, where am I? And you're like, okay, okay. I know where I am. I, you know, I'm calm down, calm down. I'm tethered. I'm good. Okay. Keep working. Don't pay attention and stuff. But you, you know, you can't help but wanting to look out and see where you are every now and then. And um, I remember um, when I was on a spacewalk with Aki Hoshidi from the Japanese space agency, uh, we were, we were sort of, uh, challenging our, each other about where exactly we were over the planet and we were joking like is it this place or is it that place you know and, and my sister wrote me an email later and said I can't believe on a, in the middle of a spacewalk you guys were were like arguing a little bit about where you were and joking around about where you were and I was like well th where else do you get such an amazing view so of course you have to do that <laughs> That's so, funny. so I mean it's overwhelming it's I cool. bet and speaking of your partner um, being kind of a life force and relying on each other, um, when you live on the International Space Station, your life seems to be dependent on a Russian, a Japanese, and many other nationalities. It seems like the world feels a little divided today. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, what inspires me about the space station is how it feels like, you know, what we should all feel here is that we're global citizens of planet Earth. Oh gosh, yeah. I mean, and you can't you can't deny that, right? So we, you know, you sort of it's sort of like my parents coming together. You sort of embrace the different cultures, 
and up there you you just do it you know because those are your friends those are your buddies those are the people that you totally rely on and your life depends on them and you can't help but feel like you're i i have a you know i brothers and sisters who i you know they they're my friends forever in my life um you know i don't have to talk to them every day i don't have to talk to them every 5 years but as soon as i see them you know all those memories come back just like you grew up with your brother and sister and you go ah you know remember this remember that that was fun and 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 those are not people of your own blood they're people from around the world and you realize that we are all actually very 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 similar more similarities than differences and the differences i also think are really cool to highlight so you can you can see how other people solve problems you know i'll give you a very basic example you know the american space program the russian space program are you know the the most historic um when they both came to success but if you go into the uh, you know go and work with the people from the other one you go like wow you solved the problem in a different way i never thought about it like that and you learn that way and it's really it was really eye opening for me and it's such a pleasure to work with the russian space agency such a uh, pleasure to go to japan and and learn how the, the you know the japanese solve problems how the europeans solve problems how the canadians solve problems and you know the indians for example at, at in isro how they're solving problems it's really a really good thing to share those ideas and examples to make us all better it's really great yeah and speaking of friends um you know right now a lot of people are facing isolation with the pandemic and they're starting to create smaller pods just to keep things safe um but you know something about being away from friends and family maybe in some form of isolation um yeah. help people what are your best tips or how did you deal with that yeah yeah you know it's not as bad as it as it first seems so you know first put that you know put that in your toolbox it's not that bad you yeah. know we can do that and and today in particular with all the technology we have we have a we have a way to reach out and talk to people and and try to learn from people and listen to people and not only listen but actually see and get that those facial expressions that um you know you miss when you're not always with people so that's those are important things there's ways to combat it but then also it allows you a little bit more time i thought particularly when i was up in space to to really reflect and and think about what's really important and who are the people who are really important and take the time then to reach out to those people it also allowed me a little bit of more creativity i think cuz i didn't get distracted by so many things around me um i wrote a blog while i was up there and i reread it after i came home like ooh i really like that you know <laughs> yeah. i was a little more deep thinking cuz i wasn't distracted by so many things uh down here on earth and i was it allowed me to focus on getting some real tasks done um and and i like i like that and then allowed me to really enjoy my free time and uh, i hear other people do this possibly take up some other new uh hobbies that you hadn't done before you know a guy i work with he said he never fished before but now he's started fishing and he's taught his 6 year old son how to fish i mean that's and he goes i would have never done that but now i have time that i need to spend with him and so yeah. why not teach some new tasks you know new new things that he can he can learn and take on in his life so i love that i I've, i've been doing um math problems with my niece i i love that you know i if it wasn't during this time get my son in on that zoom call he really is <laughs> like a little like help there <laughs> absolutely absolutely everybody has something they love and I, and she she rolls her eyes when i say i love math but i'm trying to make it fun cuz i like it You need and to put this on YouTube. You need to do a math <laughs> tutorial for all of us. <laughs> yeah, I'm in. <laughs> well, Only I if it's like elementary school. <laughs> <laughs> you I read somewhere that you love to color and and draw. Oh, is that true? Yeah. I do. I do. Yeah. Do you have um, those dull coloring books that everyone's so into? I I have some of them, but you know, it was um I love colored pencils. I don't know why I've always loved colored pencils and uh and um when i was up in space i would know people's birthdays and i couldn't send them a card you know so i would do a i would call them sunny mark cards like hallmark cards oh, and so i would just uh, like sort of stick figures of those people you remember that that commander sunny mark <laughs> card that's so good <laughs> and, and then i would like, take line could be like cards that are out of this world <laughs> <laughs> that's a good idea But it was fun because you know you think about how you can connect with people and then you know you can always take pictures of those those things 
and then send them to people. And when I got home from space, you know, I, I would give them to them. So they had a little something that had, had flown in space. You know, speaking of creativity, when you think of NASA and all the different space programs, you think a lot about science, math, technology, but how important is that creative side? Oh yeah, it's huge. I mean, if I talk to, when I talk to kids who are, you know, going to college and they're thinking and they're like, oh, you know, all you guys are engineers. I'm like, well, yes, yes, there are a lot of engineers here and, you know, STEM, science, technology, engineering, math is, is really the, you know, the core element of what we do at NASA. But when we put people in space, take a step back for a second and think about your life and how you live. If you had to put somebody in a can and have them live, they have to have a lot of just the normal stuff, right? So they have to have clothes, they have to have food, they have to have entertainment, you know, they, they have to have a lot of things. And it doesn't mean that you have to be a hardcore engineer to be part of that. I mean, the people who just make our food, they have to know, you know, all about how that stuff's going to stay in space for a long time, all that nutritional content, all the people who come up with the exercise equipment and how to write exercise protocols so that we um, can maintain the bone density, the muscle mass. You know, they, these are not engineers like we classically think about who are, um, you know, designing buildings, designing spacecraft, but they are in, necessary to have people live in space. We need all of that type of stuff. And so if you want to do anything in your life, you can still be part of the space program because what we do is put people in space and we explore and we need all of those different facets of life to be able to do that. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And you know, as an entrepreneur, I feel like there's this mindset here in Silicon Valley of failing fast and if things don't work, pivot. But what I found so interesting when I was reading about your journey and really just any sort of astronaut that gets selected, your dream of going to space takes years and sometimes doesn't even happen. So how do you keep your eye on a dream that's so far out? Like, how do you stay focused on that? Yeah, that's an interesting question. It does get frustrating. I'm, I'm, it will be the, you know, will be not the first one to tell you that. It does get like, okay, you know, how, how much of my life am I dedicating to this? And, you know, I think you just have to take a step back and think about how you're part of this building block and what the bigger goal is. Like I mentioned, going back to the moon and why we're doing that as a stepping stone for getting to the next thing of going to Mars, um, just like the International Space Station is a stepping stone for, for going to the moon. And so, you know, you think about how you're contributing. And I think when I'm here, I think about how lucky I am. I'm one of just, you know, a few people who actually get to put my foot into that spacecraft and go to space and all the other people who are here with the goal of trying to get humans to the next step. And I was, you know, honestly, I was sort of shocked when people said, oh, you know, I don't want to go to space. And I'm like, what? Everybody wants to go to space. But then, you know, you realize that maybe everyone doesn't want to, but it doesn't mean that they don't want to be part of the team, yeah. you know, and, and, and contribute. And, um, and that's, I think, the biggest, the greatest achievement is contributing. I think the biggest, most honored thing that ever happened to me was one of the people in the newest astronaut class. And the whole reason I ever applied was because of you. And I was like, ah, I think I've done my job. <laughs> Commander Sonny Williams, that's a lot of people that feel that way. So take that in because it is true. Even you sitting here today just kind of reminds me of, um, you know, uh, that whole JFK speech of we choose to go to the moon. And I think about we're on the radio right now and it's being broadcasted everywhere, but so was that speech. And so many people were rallied who maybe weren't in the US to come to the US, including a bunch of South Asians. And yep. I don't know about you, but I feel like there must be something in our South Asian DNA that calls us to be adventurers because we even have the largest diaspora on the planet, which really surprised <laughs> me. There is no other, um culture that is so spread out on this planet so i think that that's super inspiring so thank you for for sure for representing um all of us in that endeavor oh. but okay. you know you're not just representing south asians but you know i was really honestly ticked off the other day when i read that only i think it was 2.8 percent of venture capital money goes to women and it it just made me realize like we're still navigating so many uncharted territories just here on planet earth but how did you navigate your way through male dominant spaces i mean did you think about that was a zeitgeist different like could talk to us about that 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, I would be lying if I said things were not uh, different, right? But, um, but, but at the same time, they're also the same because the standards are the same, right? And it's just like if you want to have a small business, right? You got to get out there and you got to compete with the other small businesses and make your product successful. It doesn't matter who you are. That's just the fact of the matter. And the same is with in our astronaut office and the job that we do, or as I was a helicopter pilot in the military, same thing. You know, um, you just got to do do your job and get all the qualifications and do everything you can to do it correctly and right and not have somebody have to lift you up the whole time, um, what, particularly when you become experienced. And when I'm talking to little girls, I, you know, I mentioned it. I'm like, you know, there, there are definitely ba uh, barriers, but some of those barriers are in your in your own head. Like the, the helicopter didn't know if I was a girl or a boy, you know, the you right. know, spacesuit doesn't know, the spacecraft doesn't know. You just got to get out there and work with it and, and just, you know, make sure that you have done, crossed all your T's, dotted all your I's, done as much research and homework that you can do to make yourself very successful in, in the field that you're at. And you're going to come across those people who have bad attitudes, but, you know, that's their loss because then, you know, um, some of the stuff we've talked about, they're just not looking at solving problems from a different perspective and it's their loss. And you can only win and, 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 un, and get better from it by going, wow, you know, that person solves it this way. This person thinks this way. Well, I, I don't need to do it that way. I will understand maybe where they're coming from and then maybe able to capitalize on that misconception and make it even better in your own, for your own self, because they're losing out. They're not seeing, they're not seeing through that window at all. And it's unfortunate, but, um, but you're going to get ahead and they're not going to get ahead <laughs> by having those closed doors, you know, thought process. So, you know, I, I look at it very um, positively and I think you have to because you're going to have those times that it's going to not feel comfortable and it's not going to be, um, you know, you're just going to have, it's, it's going to not be nice. And so you have to just deal with that and, and realize that there's a bigger purpose in what you're doing. And I hope, you know, like we've, um, you know, we've had women in the space program since uh, the, sh the start of the space shuttle time frame, And now it's sort of like a, a no brainer. I mean, it's just sort of, it seems like we should be here. It's not that way all over the world, but it's definitely that way in the in the you know the NASA space program here in the United States. Uh, to the fact that we had a class two classes ago that was you know eight people, four men and four women, and the, oh, wow. the latest the latest class was uh, six and uh, or seven and five. So uh, pretty pretty good pretty good wow. numbers. Which, and, and it's, it's time. It takes time for women to. You know, women haven't always been in the STEM fields. Um, it's been only onesie twosies, and now the opportunities are there yeah. uh, from from the ladies who had Thanks gone before to us. <laughs> Thanks to on your shoulders, our yeah. future sits on your shoulders. So thank you. And <laughs> speaking of the future, so um, I'm here in the Bay Area, and a couple of days ago. I woke up and I kid you not, it looked like Mars. It was orange. There was almost no sun. It was a very oh. creepy. Weird. So, Weird because of the wildfires yeah and um so commander are we going to mars and if we are what's it going to take yeah we are going to mars i mean that's that's the end goal right or not the end goal that is the goal for our it might be for some of us the yeah, yeah. that's a one-way ticket right yeah. <laughs> well for humanity right i think what we want to do is we want to explore um you know going back to the moon is uh is we're going to go there sustainably not just to you know, one shot, come there, go there, come back real quick, gather a couple rocks. It's going to be living there and really understanding what it takes to live someplace away from our home planet and what the toll is on the, on the human being and the, and the mechanics and the information technology that we need to be able to do that, all that structure. Um, and then we'll start building that to go to Mars and we're going to learn so much along the way um, that gives everybody an opportunity to, to participate. And I think it's... Um, I think we're really on our way. You know, it's the time and the place. Also, technology has changed so much in the last two, you know, three decades that it seems like right now is, is the time that we really can, can actually feel it. It's in our grasp, you know, with companies like Blue Origin, SpaceX, Virgin Galactic, Sierra Nevada, you know, just to name a few right off the top of my head, it's time for them to be successful. It's time for them to uh, innovate and use these new technologies in the way that they make spacecraft, which is a lot different than we've made them in the past, better materials, better processes, that we're actually, these doors are actually opening. So the opportunities are happening. 
And it's because of all the folks at Silicon Valley, for example, and all of the folks around the world who have been innovative and ex exploring here on Earth <laughs> to allow us to, to get to this step. So yeah, I think we are definitely going to Mars. I, it's, um, it's not a place that you can uh, sort of just hang out in a t-shirt and shorts. It's going to take a little doing to be able to go there and live there, but I think we can do it, and I I, I have faith that we'll we'll get there. We're we're an amazing species. We have done amazing things, and we'll, there's many more amazing things to happen. Does that mean I have to get out of my sweatpants finally, out of these sweatpants, <laughs> and go to Mars? I'll do it from Mars. <laughs> okay. <that's laughs> um, here's my final question: How did space change you? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I think, you know, going back to that perspective of looking at our planet and looking at where we all are, I think it changes me, um, changed me a lot in the in the real short term. Like I was like, I'm not watching TV, for example. I'm I'm not I'm not looking at stuff like that because there's so much on this planet that I have to see and explore. And I was like against it entirely. But you know, you slide back to your old human ways and and try to and, and, you know fit in with society and and oh have you seen this show you guys gotta see this this is such a great show you know so you're like, you're like you don't want to be left behind so you slide back into it but in the in the longer run i think it's made me so much more tolerant and i realize that you know not everybody when i was mentioning einstein for example not everybody has had the opportunities that i have and i am so darn lucky and that you know the biggest thing i can do is try and share that with people so i appreciate you asking me to come for this interview for example and 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 just give a perspective that that shows people that you know be positive there's so many amazing good things that need to happen when i was a little kid i used to think everything was invented and i was bummed out because i wanted to be an inventor and then i realized you know more later in my life like oh no oh no there's so much more that we can learn and invent that uh, you know it, it's it's awesome and i hope we just open the doors for the next you know your kids my kids uh, the next group of uh, explorers and sh give them that light and give them that opportunity to go 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 reach for something you never dreamed of or never thought of it's it's out there it's really cool i love your message of not limiting yourself expanding our reach as humankind and if there is any one thing that makes us feel um like we can reach for the stars or shall i say mars it's really you so for that i humbly just say thank you namaste and it's a wrap people <laughs> <laughs> namaste. <laughs> thank you so much thank you it was really fun it was really yeah, okay good.